talk about Klopp and Pep right now, because, you know, part of that Carragher thing I mentioned was talking about the superlatives. They've been talking about each other. We remember that rather vigorous uh, handshake, high five, whatever you want to call it, at the end of the game last weekend. Now, this was interesting because Klopp's been talking about Pep uh, Guardiola staying at Manchester City forever. And, you know, he was asked about it by a journalist. He said, I saw it because I have to prepare for the game. I saw it because I bounced into the press conference of Pep. And I actually thought he said, I could stay here forever. I won't, but I could stay here forever. Ah, but you, he said to the journalist are cheeky enough to pick out one phrase, I could stay here forever. So that's, again, Jürgen putting a journalist in his place, saying, I'm really not sure that's too cool. If he wants to stay, please do it. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, Pep's been talking as well. He turned around and saying, uh, I-, I didn't become a manager to be the best. I'm not. Thank you so much, but I'm not. I'd like to say I'm the best, but I'm not. That's classic Pep. Pep always plays everything down. And, uh, you know, we get used to this. But what we're noticing here is a lack of toxicity, if that's the right word here. They were talking about, again, journalists in England often talk about whether a guy's going to offer another guy a drink after the game. And uh, he spoke about this one, saying uh, he knows, uh, this is Klopp, when we spoke together in Germany and hear my admiration about what he does and the message and the way his teams play, I think he's a good guy. I don't have any problems with him. Absolutely not, of course, like he says many times. We're a rich club, so the drink will be perfect, high quality. Well, whichever way you look at that, there's nobody calling anyone a foyer. There's no pizzas flying around. There's nothing really horrible about this one. Don, what's your take on the Klopp-Pep dynamic? And can it continue to be this amicable if they, as, as we expect them to, keep coming across each other in very meaningful matches with silverware attached to them? Yeah, I think they will, John. I think they respect each other immensely. Um, and maybe gone are the days where sledging has an impact on managers' performances or, or the players' performances. Maybe these two guys are completely different. They're, they're stylistically different in terms of how their teams play. But I, I wouldn't know which side of the camp to lean on, which in a cup final, FA Cup final or a semi-final or a Champions League game, where, where the margins mm. would lie for either side because two of them are absolutely brilliant. And I think... I think Pep would be foolish to criticise Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp. And I think exactly the same on the other hand. I don't think Jurgen Klopp would come out and criticise Pep. They've played against each other so many t- times. They know the style of each mm. other's size. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's a thing that's just lost us. We, we've gone past all this legend. And maybe that just doesn't happen anymore. Let's have a look at this record here, Dave, because I think there's part of this that might explain this one. I think, I think it matters most, um, you know, rivalries. In a game when it matters most, that's when things get a bit edgy, a bit nasty. We used to see that a lot in those very tight title races between Arsenal and Manchester United. But if we look at this in, in league encounters, uh, we've seen some spectacular games. City winning four, Liverpool edging this one with five wins. In terms of knockout matches, it's on as even. Yes, there was a big win for Liverpool in Champions League football, but I, I, I've not had the sense yet that they've had a chance to build this really vicious, toxic rivalry, David, or animosity. Maybe that'll come along even as early as this weekend, because when it when you can get knocked out of a competition, it's different from when you play each other in the league and you can throw everything at each other and say, what a great game we delivered, because you know that's not deciding the league, right? Yeah, it's an interesting one with the rivalry, because like football itself, there are so many different layers. And uh, if you look at the, the rivalry between Manchester and Liverpool... That in itself mm. is a social rivalry, which which will carry on forever, irrespective of who's the best team. I think for Liverpool, what it is, you've got a, a club with so much history, a rich history of being successful, that when Manchester United became dominant in the early 90s and onwards, it became, the again, social, uh, geographical and uh, achievement rivalry was, was instantaneous. Now we've got Manchester City as a dominant force in football or one of the dominant forces in football and that could continue but I don't think the football side of it will ever get toxic uh, John these players uh, for one most of them aren't English so they don't have that social background to continue that toxicity on the field mm. um, and that, like Don said you've got two managers who have teams that respect each other for the quality and therefore oh. it becomes pure rivalry about who is the best team rather than who can, I don't know, foul the others more, whatever. Well, well let's, talk about, let's talk about the fans. Let's talk about the fans. And Kartik, I'm going to come to you on this one, because if you look at, you know, David's spoken about Manchester and Liverpool and some historical socio-political background. Uh, you very often have these rivalries that come up when uh, clubs are very similar, you know, you know, they're very close to each other. And, and, and when you're close to something, sometimes you can get this kind of animosity. Um, very often, fans become fans because they have a need to hate as well as to love. So tell me this, Kartik, as well as loving Manchester City, have you found that part of your fan experience is that you should hate a club or a player? And if so, how do you feel about Liverpool? Because they are rivals to you, to take what 
what you want to win, right? Yeah. Uh, both these teams are at the top, so naturally we clash a lot, and all of the games we play against each other are important. Every point counts. Uh, so that's why uh, it's an important game, and I'm always rooting for City, of course. But uh, I think this rivalry stays on the field because sometimes rivalries uh, become a little toxic off the field. Fans clash against each other on social media and all. But I, I, I find myself uh, um, not against Liverpool that much. Like, I'm not, I don't hate Liverpool. Uh, let's say for United, I'm, when United plays, I pray that mm. uh, United doesn't play well. And mm. most of the time, mm. my prayers work. But against Liverpool... Uh, <laughs> oh, nice take, nice take. Yeah. Uh, against Liverpool, I don't wish they play bad uh, because I think Liverpool pushes City to do better. If it went for Liverpool, uh, the title would have been ours already. Uh, they, mm. keep, uh, they keep City pushing and that's why uh, they make the most... Uh, the players make the most out of the opportunities they get. They do their best. So they both the teams push each other. So that's what I like about this. It's a battle on the well, field. John. That's why I think. John, I think as well as well when you when you look at the Liverpool Manchester City rivalry, you know I don't mm. think Liverpool count Man City historically as rivals because Man City at the moment no. are rewriting their history, aren't they? You know, Man United yeah. have just got you know more or less the same amount of trophies and Liverpool one better in the in the Premier League, but mm. not as many Champions League. So they see Man United as the fiercest rival. And as I said, from, from Man City's point of view, they know probably in their heart of hearts that they're not as big as Man United. That's why they probably hate them so much because they're going to get there one day. But it, 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 at this present time, in terms of trophies and history, you know, they're re rewriting their history and they can't get close to Man United over a short period yeah. of time like Liverpool. So I think from Man City's point of view, Kartik's probably point of view towards hate in Liverpool, it just doesn't happen. And Liverpool are fond of Man yeah. City because of the style they play. But they know at the same time they're no threat to their history because Man United are. Well, guys, okay, you know, remember you can always dial in, you can always phone in if you if you don't agree, if you think there is a burgeoning hatred between City and Liverpool. If you feel that way, do let us know. But what I'd like to do right now is actually hear from the players' point of view, because we've spoken about history. No, maybe it's not there. We've spoken about fans, doesn't seem to be there. What about the players? Now, Sean Wright Phillips, of course, a former Manchester City player, has been a big part of the Sony Sports Network's uh, coverage uh, over the last few days, and you'll also see him uh, this weekend. But but we asked him from the players' take about this rivalry, and this is what he had to say. I think it's, it's slightly different. I think that there's so much mutual respect between the players and the coaches as we saw after the game and during the game. But I think just to see them go head to head like two heavyweight champions where they just no one's worried about defending. They just all focused on playing their own game was it was beautiful to see. I feel like this one is just a battle of the best. I think they both just want to be at the top and they're both at the top of the game, but they just want to outdo each other. And it is like I said, it's so great to see, especially with both teams performing at such a high level. Right, so, okay. So we're beginning really to sort of get the sense that this is just the most respectful of rivalries, right? And the other thing as well is if we take a little look at, you know, what's happened between these guys, if we take a little look uh, since, since 2019, let's have a look at the meetings here. Maybe that can point us towards anything. You tend to, uh, you know, Don, you also tend to need flashpoints, don't you? You need games and incidents, whether it be a ghost goal or remember that time when Liverpool and Chelsea kept playing each other and there were, there were these, you know, really important games played. If you look back through this set of fixtures, Apart from maybe that, that game when Sadio Mane got sent off early on for, for, for that high boot and there was a bit of bad blood, I don't remember an awful lot of uh, animosity in any of these games, do you? No, not really, not animosity. Um, that was probably the only sort of flashpoint. Um, but you look at the score lines and you look how tight it is. That's why, because I think it's one of them when you're talking about the, the, the two teams at the moment on the pitch and how they play mm. and stylistically both very different. It's literally one of them where you're watching the game unfold and after minute one, you're literally like that with a coin thinking whose days are going to be because apart from yeah. injuries, which we'll probably get onto later in, in Man City's camp, Liverpool at this present time, zero injuries. It's the marginal gains. There's not too much to separate either side and Pep has always been consistent when he's talked about the team that he fears the most mm. and not just now. Pep said this four or five years ago. He said the team that he fears the most in European football is Liverpool. So it's ingrained mm. in him.
All right, well, let's talk about domestic football. You brought it up. Let's remind everybody it's the FA Cup. It's the first of the two semi finals. Of course, you can see this across the Sony Sports Network on Saturday from Wembley. Manchester City against Liverpool from 8 p.m. And of course, that will be in uh, Hindi as well. And uh, there's plenty of. Uh, and uh, uh, Telugu as well. And Tamil as well there. So plenty of uh, options for you across those uh, different channels there. Right, guys, will this one spark it? Uh, Pep's already talking about the fact that there are injury pr uh, problems. We think that the Bruner's out. We know that Walker's bound to be out, David. Um, he's got a quadruple on the line now. So come on, this, it's coming down to the crunch now. Both teams have made it through in Europe. But this is one, this is one team either losing a treble or losing a quadruple. Will it spark this game this weekend? Well, I've just got to bring up one, almost like the elephant in the room, if you like, John. If you look at these two sides, so many of the players are friends with other players in the other team. Like, for example, Alisson and Edison are really good friends. They live near each other. Uh, kids play with each other. You've got De Bruyne and mm. uh, 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 Virgil van Dijk. I mean, these, uh, not to mention the England players. So all these guys know each other in a different team, i.e. the international team. And Don, you remember this. The first thing you say, what's he like about someone else? And I just imagine they're going to say that this guy's a really good bloke. So yeah. automatically, you put kind of, I wouldn't say you put mm. your defences down, but you, you don't want to attack the person. And therefore, it becomes just about football. And as we know, we are talking, I, I would yeah. happily say, two best teams in world football at the moment. So um, I don't think anything is going to spark it in a in a horrible way. I, hopefully, it will spark it similar to what we saw on Saturday where we get to see brilliant footballers playing brilliant football and every little mistake is punished because the opposition are at their best to be able to punish it. That's what I want to see, John. And if it creates yeah. fireworks in a footballing context, fine. It's a, it's a great point you make about the players. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. We had Jordan Henderson, captain of Liverpool, defending uh, Harry Maguire, you know, for, for the abuse that he'd received um, uh, on the international stage. And, you know, it's not that long ago that there was a lot of talk about a schism in the dressing room between Liverpool and Manchester United. And, and that kind of nasty narrative got carried through. Uh, Kartik, I just want to get your take on this one. Uh, are you worried about the, the cup semi-final? Uh, it's keeping me up at night since the last years. This league is so uh, hectic. It feels like I am one of the players and it, there's so much at stake. But uh, all I can do is like wish uh, and hope and have faith in uh, my team. And I'm sure uh, the, the injury crisis is there and everything. We had a tough week uh, with Atletico also. Uh, but uh, the players are going to give it everything. Guardiola is a genius. So... Uh, I, I, I hope they win, and I, I, I'm pretty confident it's going to be a very tough game, and we're not going to uh, back off. Right, way to support your team. Get some sleep tonight. Come on, don't worry too much. You've got a really good team, and uh, you've got every chance in this one. Cardi, thanks very much for joining us. Catch up with us again later on uh, uh, in the season, if you, if you can. It'll be nice to see you once more. We've got Liverpool fanships going to be joining us uh, very shortly as well. But we'd love you to get involved. Those are the numbers. Remember, dial in, have your say. If there's anything that's been said on the show that you strongly agree or disagree with, if you have an opinion you'd like to make, we've got more on uh, this still to come, and we'll be turning our attention to a bit of Champions League and Spanish clubs later on. So plenty for you to get involved about. We'll be back after this.
Great to have you with us here on the Top Corner. Thanks so much. Get involved. Phone in uh, for your say on the show. I think we've got some callers coming along shortly because we're going to get the Liverpool side of this Liverpool City rivalry right now, which means another fan is joining us. Also from Mumbai, we have Shiv coming on board the show. You're on the Top Corner, Shiv. You've got a great kit on there. I like the look of that. How long have you supported Liverpool, my friend? I have uh, supported Liverpool from uh, the treble season, which is, which was the Mickey Mouse treble, as they call it. Uh, so I started <laughs> supporting uh, Liverpool since then because Michael Owen, I loved Michael Owen at that point of time. So because of him, I started supporting Liverpool. All right. And, and tell me this. Uh, what's your, on a level of uh, uh, 1 to 10, with 1 being absolute love and 10 being total hate, uh, what's your yeah. attitude towards Manchester City, Shiv? Uh, is there any uh, uh, number for indifference? I don't. Like, <laughs> five, five, I reckon. <laughs> I reckon slap bang in the middle. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, yeah. That's a good start. That one. I, okay, guys, you got two former Liverpool players uh, with Don and Dave, uh, David James here, and of course Hi. David having played Pleasure. the city as well. But I want to get your, your your take on the Liverpool side of this one here, and and Don, why don't you kick us off here? Um, when push comes to shove, do you think Liverpool now are going to start getting towards the end of the season and, and Klopp in particular is going to get towards the end of the season saying, right, it's all lovely being nice and friendly and everything like that, but we need to start putting these guys away. You know, we, 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 we're going to be winning this. So what's, what's your take on Liverpool's attitude over the next few weeks then? I think their attitude now, John, for the first time in quite a while is they want to add to their trophy hall. I think that's what Jurgen Klopp wants as well. I think a few yeah. years back, I don't think the squad was healthy or, or big enough to try and contend on all levels. So I think now he's, as we've seen, you know, the other night, was it last night? I've lost track of the days because of the baby boy. He rests seven players mm -hmm. and brings in seven changes and it doesn't weaken mm -hmm. the side in a 3-3 draw against Benfica. Now he can do that at any given time where I've got no idea what his best front three is. I've got a fair idea of the rest of the team, but only Jürgen mm -hmm. knows with the opposition in mind which players he wants to go with. And you couldn't have said that back in the day. No disrespect to people like Divock Origi, who's been a cult hero. Looks like he's moving yeah. on to AC Milan and one or two other players. When Jurgen Klopp, probably a year ago, two, three years ago, John, has rested, I don't know, anything more than three or four players, the team then mm. was weakened. Not anymore. Mm. Right. So, so what's interesting, you, you mentioned uh, silverware at the start of your answer then, Don. This is really interesting to me because I think apart from those clowns out there who talk about bold frauds, I think everyone recognises Pep Guardiola in so many ways is, is one of the best uh, coaches there's been. But what about Jurgen Klopp? Does he get the recognition? How close to greatness is he? He's had some near misses in his time, not least when he first started off, of course. There was a, uh, a League Cup final loss, of course. There was the Sofia defeat in the uh, Europa League final. And again, you're looking at the squad being nowhere near as strong as it was. And then, of course, the outbreak in that particular Champions League final. Again, a goalkeeper that had a nightmare. And, uh, you know, the, the Klopp, to an extent, was characterised by near misses. You know, scoring as many points as they did and finishing one point behind Manchester City in a Premier League title race. So, does he have to... I, I just wonder, David, does he have to play catch-up? You know, does he have to sort of get a few, few more trophies to his name? I know that's not the only way that we judge people, but do you think Jurgen Klopp will be saying, before my time at this club comes up, I need to boost my numbers a little bit? Well, first thing, sir, I think what we're seeing is the evolution of a manager um, at a club that itself is evolving. Mm. I mean, of course, we can talk about the number of trophies historically Liverpool have won. Uh, when it comes to league titles, there's only one in the last 31 years. So they're, they're evolving again. And what Don was saying is interesting about squad. I think it was a masterstroke in one sense or two senses because it works. There were two titles that Jurgen Klopp needed to win, not wanted to win. I think he wanted to win everything, but he needed to win the Champions League. But more importantly, he needed to win the Premier League. So I think it was all about prioritising mm. those two trophies. This year, having won all of those things, or both of those things, so I say, he can now look at his squad, which is stronger, granted, but he can look at his squad and say, I'll tell you what, we can go for everything. I don't think at the minute, and this, this might sound con contradictory, I don't think he's going for a quadruple per se. I think he's believing in his system and his players, saying that we can win every game from now to the end of the season, in which case we will have four trophies in our cabinet. In answer to your question, John, yeah, let's get the silver polish out and let's start polishing trophies because mm. that's what Liverpool is about. And they're I finally at that stage. 
I, I want to I want to come back to this in just a moment and have a little look at that Klopp silverware thing. Yeah, I, I think one thing we do accept is that we've come to the really the business end of the season. And if they are to win things, then they need their main man, Mo Salah, who, who is that main man, without any doubt, to be firing in all cylinders. And I think we've got a caller uh, coming in from Kolkata. Uh, Akka is with us. He wants to talk about that, I think. Akka, you're on the top corner. What's your question? Yes, uh, I just want to ask David uh, that what is his uh, opinion on Mo Salah's form? Mo Salah is not scoring in the last couple of games, although he had made a brilliant assist in helping Sadio Mane to score in making a tie with Manchester City. But uh, some of do you not feel that uh, he's losing the ball very easily at this moment? He's not controlling the ball in the fashion when he used to score the goals uh, in a very uh, in a very very, very frequently and very easily. Okay, I think you I think you said that was for David. David, if you want to kick this off, I know Donald Diven as well. Let's keep it nice and quick, guys. Uh, I, I, I'm laughing a bit when I hear people critical of Salah. Right, first of all, John, let, uh, let's chronologically look at it. Before the Africa Cup of Nations, Salah, I believe, was trying too hard to score goals and was ineffective. He goes away for a month. He comes back, tries to make up for lost ground and has been ineffective from his goal-scoring stance. But what we saw against Man City was what Mo yeah. Salah, I think, is actually probably better at because uh, being an assist because he's second in the list with 10 assists for um, actually 11 assists for Liverpool this season. And when Mo Salah plays for the team, Liverpool are more successful. When Mo Salah plays for Mo Salah, that's when Liverpool fails. So I'm not saying, unlike you, John, I think Mo Salah is in a good place at the moment. If he continues playing this way, he'll create chances and then he'll get his goals. But he is Don, key, quick, key to their success. Absolutely. Don, quick word, and then Shiv's going to jump in as well. Off you go, Don. Yeah, what do you reckon? I think, yeah, John, I think people have to try and remember that footballers are not machines and they can't turn it all, all of the time. And the, and the mental aspect of the game is becoming more apparent. And you look at what journey Mo Salah's been on. As David said there, missing out in the African mm. Cup of Nations, that would have hurt. Then a month later, yeah. he misses out on a World Cup for Egypt, but it didn't yeah. qualify. He's trying to sign a brand new contract. You know, his forms just for his standards just dropped off a little mm. bit. So you take them three or th four things into the equation. No wonder he's not playing at his best level. But he's the type of guy, as we saw against Man City, yeah. I can bring it back just like that. Yeah, great point, great point. Shiv, yeah, I want to just, uh, if, if you've got a major concern with Salah, tell me. I'd like to hope that you don't, because I don't think any Liverpool fan should do. But I, I also want to talk about Klopp, because I don't think we can let this business about silverware go. I noticed earlier on, when we were talking about this, you were nodding along in agreement here. Do you, as a Liverpool fan, feel that Jurgen Klopp hasn't quite won as much silverware over the period as he could have done. I mean, if we put his numbers up against the greatest managers or some of the greatest managers of recent times, and we've already shown you some of those near misses, then the number of trophies he's got, which incidentally yeah. is exactly the same that Gerard Ullier uh, collected during his time at the club. And I, I suspect Liverpool fans probably already hold Jurgen Klopp in higher esteem, you know, as a coach. Do you think those numbers are inadequate for, for, for Jurgen Klopp, Schiff? Uh, so first, to answer your question about Salah, I have no complaints whatsoever about Mohamed Salah. He is the second highest assist getter in the Premier League right now uh, before Trent. And uh, I feel that, yes, fatigue comes into play. And we, I read somewhere that uh, this is the first time that we, we, we are challenging all the three domestic trophies. And we are there in all the three domestic trophies yeah. when we are in April after a long time. So, I understand the fatigue. I understand the fatigue that Salah has. Mm. Second thing, Klopp uh, not winning a lot of trophies. I Again, I disagree with it. I really, really disagree with it. Why? As you rightly said, that we have had our near misses. And it was a work in progress when Klopp took over. Now, if you see what he did at Dortmund. Uh, he served Dortmund for seven years. He won five trophies within that. Uh, mm. uh, this is his seventh season going on with Liverpool and he has already won five trophies here. So the progression of Klopp is similar to what he was doing at Dortmund and the project is also very similar. So I understand the lack of trophies now, but if this season we end up with only one trophy, if we don't end up with mm. at least two trophies, one of them which might can, can be the Premier League or the Champions League, then I would... I would think that, oh, we could have won more. But right great now, point, I don't point. have any Shiv, problem. I'm going to bring, bring the guys in on that. I like, I like that, Shiv. Right, David, what would be a good result? Come on. Well, a good result for Liverpool's winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah Shiv, I, lo I love that. He's doing really well unless he doesn't win any more trophies. Um, <laughs> a great result. I mean, 
if you could split it as two two, but which one becomes the second for Liverpool? I mean, I I would love them to do the quadruple purely because someone has to do it at some we point. We all would. We all would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But see, I, I, what would be good? I think Liverpool will beat City on the weekend. Put it that way. Um, in which case, they're in a prime position to lift the FA Cup. I think City are favourites to win the Premier League. I just don't know where that Champions League is going to go because these two will meet each other in, what, five, six weeks, whenever it is, uh, hopefully in a final. Let's see who's available. <laughs> Joe, I, lo- I love I've this conversation because I just don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. I think sometimes it's good to say, sometimes it's good to say, I don't know, isn't it? It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I say yeah. it all the time, Don. <laughs> right, I've just, you know what I need to do? I need to get someone else into this conversation. Uh, Mayor is with us from Kolhapur uh, on the line. Uh, Mayor, on the top corner, what would you like to say? Yeah, so this season has been great for Liverpool till now. We are in all competitions. And so, but considering Unai Emery's uh, Villarreal in the semi finals, uh, how tricky it could be for the Liverpool, considering the Spanish uh, team record against Spanish teams, uh, European speciality of, you know, Unai Emery, how, how tricky it could be. More than tough, yeah, it could question. be more tricky. We're going to talk about that, Maya, uh, in terms of the Spanish side of it a little bit later on. But I think, Don, let's get straight into this one. How tough uh, an opponent will they be, uh, 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 Villarreal? Yeah, well, 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 Jurgen Klopp said it last night. He said he, his thought process is not on Villarreal because there's so many more games to play. His thought process now is at the weekend. But they are a good side. They've dumped out Juventus, dumped out Bayern Munich. So you mm. get to the Champions League semi-final, and especially Unai Emery's record in competitions, they have to be respected. I would, however, fancy Liverpool to go through to a final, but they can't be mm. complacent. Shiv, I'm going to give you a league run in here, and I'm going to ask you to tell me about uh, all competitions, your, your thoughts over the rest of the season, but in particular the Premier League. So, you know, that, that's one that I think undeniably Liverpool need to start winning a little bit more often these days. Uh, yes, there are one or two fixtures that we still need to think about, but, but go on then, tell me how Liverpool plot their way through and just sneak past Manchester City. Uh, the, you know, we have to win all our matches and uh, we uh, and hope that City slips up somewhere. I still believe that City will slip up somewhere, but I have also this uh, fear that we will too. So, I really don't know where the Premier League will go. So, I, I definitely believe that Klopp uh, is hunting for that FA Cup. He wants one more domestic cup in his, uh, in his uh, kitty. And I am now thinking that since we have Villarreal in the semi-final, he will be uh, wanting to get over that hurdle as e- as cautiously as possible because Villarreal have been giant killers in this competition, and Unai Emery mm-hmm. has gotten the better of Klopp in club competi- in cup competition. Yeah. So he will be yeah. wary of that. So for me, I think uh, we need to uh, you know we need to win all our matches in the Premier League and then. Hope for the best. City slips up. That's it. Shiv, thank you very much for joining us. Been great having you here. Just before we all go, Don, you know, we showed those fixtures, and obviously that United game is match uh, week thirty, and it's a bit of a higgledy piggledy set because of all the, the the rearranged fixtures and what have you. Just quickly, do you see Liverpool overhauling City for the for the league? Yes, I do. Um, with with no certainty whatsoever, but I do. I think Liverpool have got momentum. I think City now. Guardiola said mm. it. You know, they're, they're not looking jaded, but Carl Walker's going to be a miss. Cancelo can go at right back, so it's not huge. Nathan Nake could come in, but De Bruyne is going to be the one where they're going to be missing. So if Liverpool are on it, and they have to be flawless, that's the thing, John. They have to be flawless yeah. from now at the end of the yes. season. But it's in, yeah. you know, Liverpool can do it. They can. Yeah, and of course, all these competitions will affect other competitions. And of course, starting off with the next encounter between these two sides, let's remind you one more time, we've got it coming along, the first of the FA Cup semi-finals. It will be an epic. David James will be at Wembley as Manchester City take on Liverpool. Make sure you catch that across all those channels in different languages right here on the Sony Sports Network. Right, that's Manchester City and Liverpool, the great rivalry that we've spoken about. Shiv, thank you so much for joining us. Great having you with us. I wish you all the very best. Enjoy the game this weekend if you can. We've got Richard Jolly, uh, journalist uh, and uh, statistician supreme, joining us after the break. We're going to be turning our attention to Spain and Champions League and European football. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're with me, John Dykes, here on the Top Corner on the Sony Sports Network. And we have been privileged this week with some of the football we've seen. The Champions League has provided us with semi-finalists. And if we just remind ourselves what happened, it did so in really thrilling, spectacular, dramatic fashion. If we just have a look at those results and then get into it, there's a theme we want to develop, which is the Spanish sides and how they've managed to match the English pace for pace into the semi-finals. A thriller at the Bernabeu with Real Madrid seemingly down and out against all odds before the brilliance of Modric and, of course, King Karim Benzema seeing them through. Bayern, six-time winners dumped out by the minnows? Well, are they really minnows of Villarreal? We know that Unai Emery is someone we need to talk about. Liverpool getting through despite late goals from Benfica with a 6-4 aggregate victory. And Manchester City having to suffer in a rare nil-nil in heated scenes at the Wanda Metropolitano. Wow, that was a week of Champions League action that had just about everything. So we're going to talk about the Spanish, and we're going to talk about how they get the job done right now. Another guest joining us, by the way. Let's uh, bring him into this conversation. Journalist Richard Jolly is with us. Richard, good to have you with us once again. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start you off with a nice, juicy uh, half volley on the uh, leg stump for you to smash away. Tell us a bit about that game between Chelsea and Real Madrid, because it's just simply stunning for me in, in the way that we're privileged to have seen a brilliant Premier League encounter last weekend, and we've seen a game that will live long in my memory in the Champions League this week. That had everything that match, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely everything. I mean, at one stage, it looked as though it would have been one of the greatest European comebacks of all time, one that you could have bracketed alongside Liverpool beating Barcelona 4-0 in the second leg uh, in the semi-finals in 2019, or the Tottenham comeback in the 2019 other semi-final against Ajax, and instead... Mm. What you get is proof of Real Madrid's enduring ability to find a way, um, epitomised really by Luka Modric and Karim Benzema, yeah. two special players doing special things. And, and Real Madrid and the European Cup, the story just goes on and on. Yeah, and this is the point we have to make. We're talking about Spanish supremacy. Now, we'll broaden it beyond the Champions League a little bit later on. But the reality here is that Spanish clubs in Europe since 2010, this is the record. If you take a look at the two major competitions, obviously the Champions League and the Europa League, right? Then they always lead the way, OK? Number of teams involved, yep. Uh, quarter finalists, 46. England next with 34. Then Germany, 26. And Italy, 18. Semi-finalists, 33 to England's 20 to Germany's 13 to Italy's 9. Finals, 17 to 14 to 5 to 4. Wins, 14. Staggeringly, 14 wins to England's 6. And Germany, uh, only two, of course, there. And, and Italy, just the one. So it's fascinating to try and get behind this one because there was a time when Barcelona might have done it with swagger, uh, Don. But... It seems to me that there's a word that we hear. There's a word we hear a lot from coaches like Pep Guardiola from Simeone, and it's suffer. They use it in English, saying, you know, we, we had to suffer. I have this theory that clubs, whether it be Real Madrid the other night or whether it's been Atletico, who we'll talk about later, or others, Spanish clubs just know how to stay alive in competitions. They know how to stay alive and give themselves a chance. That's why they end up with these numbers. Am I right in saying that? Fair point. Look at the, look at the Real Madrid performance um, against Chelsea when we're 3-0 down and mm. I heard Luka Modric say after the game and I was watching the game and he said we were dead and they were they were absolutely mm. dead and it could have been four and then all of a sudden they turn it on I think we've seen obviously the, the experience of players like Luka Modric and Benzema but we've also seen the future and people like Valverde and Camavinga um, but they do they're, they're, it's, in, it's in their it's in, the, it's in their DNA it's ingrained in them but I think what's happening uh, is, is I think the English sides now are catching up and it took a long mm. time, I think, for us to catch up. You know, in terms of can they keep hold of the ball like the Spanish teams, like the Barcelona seeds that were just incredible, like the Galacticos of Real Madrid. They were, they were mm. levels above. Now you're looking at teams like Liverpool and Man City and you think, well, we've got the levels. You know, I think Real Madrid are very close to being back. Barca, I think, will be another year or two mm. or three before they get back to the very top. But the English sides, in my opinion, I think since 2010, even though that, those sort of stats don't reflect that, as I think we're catching up very quickly. Well, well, I wonder how much of that is down to what they've learned from the Spanish clubs. Let's get to a caller yeah. right now. Uh, Rohan is with us from Delhi. Rohan, are you with us here on the top corner? Uh, please fire away. Uh, hi, John. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I just wanted to like remind that, you know, the uh, European, the, the Spanish team, they're just, you know, they're, they're again dominating on the European stage. So what is it that is, you know, separating these 
Spanish teams that, you know, they're so consistently good in Europe. You take Villarreal, for example, they defeated Juventus, they gave Manchester United a tough time. So what is making them so good in Europe? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, David, I'm going to come to you in just a moment, or maybe you want to jump in on Richard here, just because Richard and I were chatting a little bit earlier on the, this evening about this one, and we think it might come down to priorities for certain clubs uh, in, in Spain. You know, they might, might maybe know, Richard, that the, 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 the title might not be within their reach, but what is within their reach is winning a piece of silverware in Europe, right? We've seen that time and time again, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. In Spain, over the last decade or so, three of the four Champions League spots have gone pretty much every year to Real Madrid, Barcelona and Atletico Madrid. So if you're one of the other clubs, a Sevilla, a Valencia, a Villarreal, Athletic Bilbao, Real Betis, you, could, you know that there's, there's potentially the fourth Champions League spot available, but maybe there's also the chance to win the Europa League. And it's something Sevilla as a club have specialised in. And it's something that Unai Emery as a manager has specialised in. And Jurgen Klopp last night was asked about facing Villarreal in the next round. And he immediately came up with a good phrase for Unai Emery. He called him the king of the cups. Um, and mm. more than anyone, he is the king of the Europa League. Uh, having said all of that, it's one thing to say we are going to target the Europa League. It's another thing to do it. And you and Don were talking earlier about suffering. You look at those finals that Sevilla have won. They've gone behind in quite a lot of finals. They went behind to Liverpool. They yeah. went behind to Inter Milan. They went behind to Dnipro. They came back and won all of them. They didn't panic when they were behind. And in a way, the Europa League dominance of the Spanish clubs is almost more impressive than the Champions League dominance because Real and Barcelona yeah. have had the absolute superstars and not just Messi and Ronaldo. They've had this vast financial advantage. You look at the Europa League every year, Sevilla don't necessarily have the biggest budget. They don't necessarily have the most talented players and the same applies to Villarreal last year, but they do know how to win it. Yeah, and David, that makes them battle-hardened. You know, I would argue that these Spanish clubs are battle-hardened in Europe, and that comes through when it matters most, right? Look at Unai Emery. He has honed his craft. He knows what he needs to do to get results in Europe. And whether it's Europa or Champions League, we're seeing it doesn't matter a whole heap. Yeah, I, I think as a, as a coach, obviously, he tactically, he gets these things right. But it, what, what yeah. I find interesting and... What we just said there was a good point. When you look at the teams that are successful in Europe, not the Real Madrid's and Barcelona's, it's the ones who haven't got the budgets of the aforementioned uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona, for example, or even that Atleti, Atleti in, uh, in that context. So the players at those clubs have to work harder to be in there in the first place. I think with the Premier League, with, mm. I agree with Don, I think things are improving. But if you look at the, the, the spending infrastructure, it's allowing for that improvement. Whereas you're going to these sides in Spain, and India is a great example. The viewers here will know a load of Spanish players, not necessarily the top names, who are playing right. in the Indian League because they're coming through a system where they have to work that much harder to be able to get to the top, rather than. And I say it respectfully, um, the academies we got here, which you know there's 100 kids in each academy, they're going to be able to pick the best because there's loads of them to pick from. Let's talk about motivation. Let's also remind you, it is uh, Villarreal who've earned themselves that uh, dream semi-final, I think, for so many people uh, against Liverpool. That's something that you'll be able to uh, watch, obviously, uh, right here on the Sony Sports Network. Because this is one that uh, Jurgen Klopp's been asked about already. He's been warned about the danger posed by Villarreal. And the fascinating thing about this one is that you can't, you can't even dare to try and portray this one as a kind of minnows against giants because you have to understand that even though they come from this famous tiny town of 50,000, that they are bankrolled by a billionaire, that they have had funds to spend, maybe not in the league of everyone else at the top of the Deloitte money list. But what I like about Unai Emery as much as anything here, Don, is what he said here. I absolutely love the fact that he came out and said, we are here not for you to say that we are nice or to say that we're a likable team in a small town. No, no, no. We have a solid and stable project owned by the Roy family. They've been here for many years. They've even reached a semi-final before. And we have a team that work and prepare themselves in order to achieve an important run. So our goals before the match, we talked about it. We didn't want to just give a good impression or have them talking about us despite being knocked out. We want to progress. We want to reach the semi-finals because it's our chance and we want to play it. Wow, you know, Don, when I see that, and when I see a, a team made up of players who some people might misguidedly dub, you know, Premier League misfits or failures, I see the ingredients with that great coach of, of a win. And I, I would be very wary of this side. Should Liverpool be? 
Absolutely. And if I was Unai Emery, I'd put that graphic there and I'd put that statement there in every dressing room that he goes to because it's mm. it's it's a motivational one, isn't it? You know, you, you read that yeah. and you think, right, they're not just here to make up the numbers. They've got good players. They've got a brilliant manager. They're fanatically backed by their, their owners and their fans. The individuals like Pau Torres is a brilliant centre-half. I'll be all alongside him. Danny Parejo in the middle of the park is a brilliant technician. I phoned Jody Morris about four years ago and, talk, and told him about Samuel Chukwese, a young Nigerian that I'd seen yeah, yeah. in Europa League, as I said, three or four years ago. He's being tracked by everyone. Um, I think he's, mm. his family or, he, or his agent, his brother or his father. Real Madrid are on red alert, uh, red alert Barcelona the same. So everyone's watching him. He's a real talent. He got the goal the other night that took mm. him through. And they're very hungry. They, 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 they're not just there for the numbers. They play unbelievably football. They're, they're, their style is, is, is brilliant to watch because they can slow the game down, I think, better than mm. even a Man City at times. They play the game at their tempo and they go, no, nope, we're going to keep hold of the ball. But when we're good mm. and when we're free and if we open you up, we're going to attack you with pace. If, if we yep. have to suffer, the word that you mentioned there, they've got good defenders who will sit deep and they'll... They'll, they'll, they will suffer out of possession, but they've got real good players. Mm. I think they know their style, they know their place, and they're not going away. Uh, let's talk a bit, Richard, about Unai Emery and Arsenal. Uh, as Arsenal falter and stutter and struggle and, and try and get themselves sorted out in this race for the top four, there, there must be fans asking themselves, did, did, we, did we mistreat this guy? Were we disrespectful? And I'm not just talking about mocking his pronunciation of English and stuff like that. I mean, have they missed a trick here? Well, Mikel Arteta's reign goes from highs to lows. So at any given point, you can draw very, very different conclusions. Um, but you could also say the same at Unai Emery's reign, because within his first few months, he had that unbeaten run of about 20, 22 games. Yeah. And it's in every decision he made went absolutely brilliantly. I do think communication is part of the issue. And I don't mean the sort of the mockery of his of his English. I just mean in terms of getting his message across. Because when I look at Unai Emery's career, He's been a real overachiever at every Spanish club he's managed, not just Villarreal, whether it's been Valencia, whether it's been Sevilla. I don't think his record has been quite as good when he's been abroad, and I don't think his relations have been quite as good, and that's including PSG and it's including his time in Moscow. And I'm not saying this as a criticism, because I couldn't do my job in another language. Um, and he's tried to learn English and he's tried to learn French, but I think he's just much better at communicating with his players in Spanish. He, he's a manager who has a famous attention to detail. He loves video analysis sessions. And I think it works better when he can communicate in his native language. Whereas with Mikel Arteta, of course, regardless of how good a manager he is, he is someone whose English is absolutely perfect. Mm. Yeah, brilliant points you make there and great insights as well, Richard. Thank you so much for uh, bringing that to the show today. Guys, um, I think I'm fair to say it's going to kick off uh, in the last part of the show because we're going to talk about Atletico. That's something we really need to do, not just in terms of uh, relating to what happened in the most recent game we've seen them play, but also their part in this so-called Spanish dominance. We need to understand what they are whether they're a team that's punched above its weight, whether they're a team that should do better than they do. And we need to decide whether we like them or not. This could get heated. We want your calls. Those are the numbers. And I'm sure you must have an opinion on Atletico one way or the other. They're up next.
You know, long after the shenanigans, the hair pulling and the uh, fists had stopped flying at the Wanda Metropolitana last night, the Atletico faithful stayed in the stadium making an enormous amount of noise, leading people to think that they must have loved what they'd seen and showed the support for their club. But what did they see? Let's have a look at the stats of that game against Manchester City over two legs and really get into what it is that uh, Atletico do and whether or not it's acceptable for fans or for anyone really. Over two legs, Manchester City had 25 shots to 14. Only three on target to three uh, in terms of uh, those stats. Yeah, fine. But what about possession? What about the way you play? The unquantifiable stuff here. What do Atletico do? Is it acceptable to play that way? And do the means, I suppose, or the ends rather, justify the means? Don Hutchison, why don't you rip into this one? Are you a fan of what Atleti do and what they did, uh, the way they go about their football? To a certain extent, I am, John. I think Simeone is a brilliant manager who gets the maximum, I think. No, I'll take that back. Not the maximum. He gets a certain amount at his indiv individual's. And I tweeted mm. last night if Guardiola was in charge of Atletico Madrid, they'd win La Liga over and over and over again because I've got a list of individuals there. Thomas Lamar, Jao Felix, Griezmann, Rodrigo de Paul, Lorente. Incredible footballers. Yet he wants them to win ugly. And yes, when they're suffering out of possession, these guys can try and get on the ball. But, you know, if mm. these guys were managed under Pep Guardiola, they'd be playing a different way. And I think it would suit the individuals and suit the team more. And what I don't like about Atletico Madrid you know, it's like going back to school. Oh, we're not, we're not winning. Oh. We're just going to pull someone's hair. We're going to have a fight. We're going to cause a ruckus. We're going to try and, we're going to try and bully individuals, if you like. It was a sour taste, I think, that that I watched towards the end of the game. Over the two mm. legs, I thought they were fascinating. I've seen them a million times before, and they're a good side yeah. to watch. But I think we can get so much more out of those individuals. You know what they are? They're a team that's very much in the in, made in the image of their coach. The, the way they play, the way they act, they are exactly like him, both as he was when he was a player and now as he is. But he's also the highest paid coach in world football, David. This is something I think people will find hard to reconcile because he always gives the impression of being this punchy underdog and that his club is some kind of a punchy underdog. But this is a club that can afford to spend $100 million on Joao Felix, a club that has been reaping, reaping 10 years' worth of Champions League revenue, particularly in the latter stages. And a man, look at that number, earning a staggering amount of money. Do you, do you see him as the best coach in the world? Because the, the money would suggest he is. I mean, no, that's... No, look, no, I think, think, sorry, just yeah, quickly, have a look at these use... stats. This is league position and, uh, and, and ranking based on transfer expenditure, i.e. what they should do based on what they spend. So, so clearly he's not delivered, or they've not delivered on that front. Sorry, carry on now. Yeah, the, the point is, I mean, just to use simple um, uh, monetary figures to explain your... I mean, it's a good graph, it's interesting, um, but there are players who should be earning more according to the their abilities in, in all different clubs. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Just want to go back to a point which Don was saying there, and I think this is the key. If those players are doing what he wants them to do, when you say in his image and likeness, then they are fantastic players and they could be playing for Pep and winning leagues. If they're doing it because that's the type of player he wants, they wouldn't last five minutes with Pep because Pep wouldn't want his players to do that. And I think this is what, what you're trying to work out, whether they're skillful players with bad, bad behavioural issues or whether they're skillful players who are subservient to their manager, in which case mm. maybe he's getting too much money because a better manager would get those players to play better, win leagues and contest Champions League finals. Well, I, can't imagine, Jemo, I can't imagine when you look at people like Thomas Lamar and Griezmann mm. and Rodrigo de Paul and João Felix, I mm. can't imagine that they're nasty players in terms of what, what style. They're, they're very elegant players. No, they're brilliant footballers. Yeah, but, uh, but, but, but Don, we... We share change rooms with some nice people who would stick a boot in every now and again and laugh about it. And some yeah. of them were internationals. And that's the point. Yeah. If you're that yeah. type of player, you fit Simeone's bill. If you're not that type of player, then arguably you fit Pep Guardiola's bill because you wouldn't maybe, do it if he didn't want you to. Maybe, or maybe, maybe, you know, I'll go back five or six years when he was successful in winning La Liga and winning trophies. He had a very ugly side in a 4-4-2 formation, probably before mm. Thomas Lamar came in probably before João Felix came in, definitely before Rodrigo de Paul came mm. in. So his side were winning ugly because the individuals knew exactly what they're doing. Now, all of a sudden, he's brought all this flair in and he spent all this money to make them stylistically a better mm. team to watch. They're not the same. They're a, they're a hybrid. 
All right, just quickly, because we're running a little tight for time now, I've got one last question for both of you here. Um, they've, they've got themselves to a couple of uh, Champions League finals, semi-finals. Uh, they've, they've got right up there at the top of La Liga. The, the two Europa League wins along the way. Those fans who stayed behind are clearly satisfied with what's been delivered to them by that team over the last decade or so. Do you agree? Is that fair enough? Uh, 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 yeah. Why would anyone complain? Right, David? Well, yeah, yeah, the thing is, John, I mean, this is it. We, if... If Atletico Madrid fans enjoy seeing that style of football, then that's all Simeone needs to do. And occasionally they might win yep. something. I mean, they shouldn't mm. know. I don't yep. think for one minute that every team should look like Man City or Liverpool. We need mm. we need difference in football to make it the beautiful game. Yeah, brilliant stuff. And, and, and they leave everything out on the pitch, don't they? You know, they work yep. incredibly hard, which the fans then can get on board with. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Let's have a quick reminder about the FA Cup coming along. And uh, this is the one that you do not want to miss. In fact, you don't want to miss any of them, obviously. But we have got Manchester City against Liverpool again, this time in the FA Cup semi-final. Sean Wright Phillips will be in the studio. David James will be at Wembley. Coverage starts from 7 p.m. The kickoff is at 8 p.m. That is going to be epic. And then, of course, on Sunday, we have the second of those semi-finals for you right here on the Sony Sports Network. And that is one that sees Chelsea. Goodness me, how do they recover from all that they went through the other night as they take on Crystal Palace in an all-London affair? Kick off at 9 p.m. again from Wembley. Well, the best FA Cup coverage are coming your way on the Sony Sports Network. And the best chat for the last hour or so that I could have possibly hoped for, in large part down to David James. Thanks very much for being here. Don Hutchison, again, I'll let you get back to your, your growing family. You've got a five-side theme there now, Don. All the very best. Thanks very much, guys. That's it from me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for phoning in, and we'll see you again next week. I'm John Dyke saying thanks for being with us on The Top Corner.